Hello, everybody. This podcast is Lava. My name is James Hunt. With me, Silas Whitlock. And to my left, Sam Shoemaker. You're all right, James. I am all right. Oh, my gosh. Oh! They keep cutting me off. This is our third intro, people. So, so unfair. No, just keep talking. It's fine. Whatever. Just cut me off. We don't want Anyways, to, we don't want to hear from that. I'm trying to greet the listeners. Small. Then greet them. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. Anyways, so today's topic is in the same vein as last episode, which was John Dillinger. So we're talking about more gangsters, or at least one more gangster. And uh, as long as Sam and Silas want to do research on gangsters, we're going to talk about gangsters because they're pretty gangster. It's a really fun yeah. time in history. Yeah. There's a lot of shooting. Some of these literal OGs. Yeah, very, yes, mu- very much real. so. The, the, yep. Original gang. Were you going to say the OG I, gangsters? Well, I was going to say... I, I, the OG gangster gangsters? <laughs> yep. These guys were gangster before it was gangster to be gangster. So today's person of interest is Babyface Nelson. So to set the scene, we have to go back... To the year 1908. So get out your suspenders, people. And get out your suspenders whoosh. and get out your your newspaper boy hats. And grab your flasks. Let's go. So the year was 1908. And in that year, a boy named Lester Joseph Gillis was born. He was later to be known by George Babyface Nelson. Now, George Babyface Nelson was an American bank robber in the 1930s. As we talked about last week with John Dillinger, he would be later associated with the second Dillinger gang. Fun fact about George Nelson. At the age of seven, he shot his first person. Accidentally, though. Yes. He shot, his, he, he shot his friend. He was he found a pistol, and he was uh, playing around with it. And That's what I did when I was seven. I found pistols and played around with them. Yeah. That's actually like the first uh, piece of information we really have about him. There's not much to talk about and that's why we need gun reform in this country guys yeah uh yeah back in 19 uh, (laughs) what i was gonna say back in 1908 but back in 1915 yeah they needed gun reform we did we people were too loose and silly with guns so let their toddlers just suck on that the barrels of their (laughs) freaking firearms so if a seven-year-old today accidentally shot his friend what do you think you know like what would you do lots of therapy probably right like just talk to him. It's like, traumatic. It's traumatic. That's it's traumatic. horribly Don't traumatic. Did, if it's an accident, if it was truly an accident, right, which right. we're assuming it is, it'd be horribly traumatic. I wouldn't mean to shoot my best friend at seven. Exactly. Seven year olds are dumb. And as a kid, you're probably thinking it's like I only did that on accident. You're probably thinking maybe it's a toy or something like that. Yeah. The, yeah there used to be four of us. We Dad to... points it at mom all the time. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, <my God>. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, what's your point, Sam? Well. My point is that his punishment was to be sent away to like a reformatory thing. It, it, you, like it, a juvenile retreat. It's like that's exactly what it was. Yeah. It was like a juvenile like home. Yeah, it was like juvenile detention kind of. And it was, but it and was it, essentially just jail. It was juvie. For, it was jail for a seven year old. Yeah, but they didn't call it that necessarily. Yeah, we're gonna reform you. We're going to make mold we're, you into a better. Oh no, he just became a gangster. <laughs> yeah for real because here's the poor kid okay babyface like one of the known or not one of the known but one of the the things about babyface is that he was super small like all throughout childhood and all throughout as like his entire life he was just a short guy um and so even as a child he had been picked on for how small he was so imagine being super small and then getting sent to like juvie exactly there's there's no hope that like you wouldn't just be It's like the run Silas or I yeah, going exactly. to juvie. It's it, yeah, at my current height. That's yeah. true. Sam, you were always chunky. If I went to juvie <laughs> at seven, I would have been the boss. Uh, they would just be like I would have no skill. Sam would have walked in and be like, Hey, I'm the boss. No, they'd no, be like, Your book and action is stupid. I'd be like, Punch uh, him in the face. I don't know. Uh, I guess I'm the boss now because I'm the biggest. You wouldn't have been the boss. You would have been the guy that creates like the shivs and stuff for people <laughs> yes. to break out. Like, but you would have like, like made you got them... no purpose other than making us weapons to break out. And you're like, okay, please don't beat me up. That's exactly what you would be. Perfect. I'd be the guy in the corner. You like, do you want patina on that too? <laughs> just like scraping a spork into a sharp object. <laughs> I'd just make a podcast. That's true. They'd put me in mental asylum because I'm just to, talking to a stick. <laughs> welcome to this podcast is the State Reformatory. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the State Reformatory. They're like, what? Why do you have what? What is this? You only you ever have one. Kid? You only ever have one guest, and it's just the crazy guy retelling the story. And that Say crazy guy, that crazy guy retelling a story, is just 
another personality of yours so it's just a (laughs) one-man podcast but you change your voice but you insist upon switching to the other microphone so you have to like run (laughs) so yeah i was an actor one time i stuck up a guest and then you run back you know so anywho yeah anywho back to uh babyface nelson now once he's released he very quickly joins like a young kids gang do you know how old he is approximately when he leaves uh, well, it would have been one year later, so he would have been oh, eight. just one year. Yeah, so he was about eight years old, um, eight or nine, and then not long after that, he's arrested again for theft and joyriding at the young, young age of thirteen. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. That's when I started driving. Yeah, it's not quite as bad as in burnout. Ski. You can, like, yeah, if, no, not quite. If he's a small kid, and I mean, back then cars wouldn't have adjustable seats. These would be like mm-hmm. Model Ts. You they know. barely had steering wheels because they didn't think that was necessary. Exactly. Why would you need that? So yeah, you yeah, can just imagine. For steering wheels. <clears throat> exactly. He's whip him. <laughs> yeah. Wait. Take me someplace. I don't care. You can just imagine <laughs> that he's like driving this down the street with like a rock on the gas pedal and just like bumping into carriages and. Just want to point <laughs> out, they could probably catch him on foot. Yeah. Very slow speed. Uh, well, no, riding. I thought that they could go like up to like cars back then could go up to like 30 miles an hour. I thought they were relatively quick. I don't know. I mean, they're relatively quick, but at the same time, that's... I don't know who you guys are, but I definitely can't run. Like, I can't run above like Hussein five Bolt, miles per hour. Wow. Yep. But they would have had motorcycles. Probably. No, maybe. No, maybe not. Probably not. Know. Anywho. Not so he important. Was, he, he, he were motorcycles before. He got. I don't know. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the first motorized bike came out in like the 1800s. Anywho, science people. Ooh, this is also a history podcast. Get ready to get bored. <laughs> <laughs> people, Aliens, man. <laughs> Aliens. Oh, wow, our viewers just dropped by half right then and there. Oh, no. Now no, we only have back, six please. listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, <laughs> that's cost him an additional 18 months in a uh, penal school. So I think that's, again, like a reformatory, like, I don't know what a penal school is, but it doesn't sound fun. Something to make him not be bad. Um, Again, another like juvenile place. Exactly. The exactly. Juves. He was in the penal school for about eighteen months, and you can only assume that it, you know. So now he's he's fourteen, roughly. Yeah, he would roughly fourteen, he, he just getting out of like. Well, we're talking about him getting out of the the school, right? Yeah. So he would have been about fourteen or fifteen mm-hmm. when he gets out. So he's been in just j- getting. He's been in quote unquote jail twice. Already. Yes, and or this some, isn't just jail. Yeah, but this is Catholic jail. Time. Yeah. So really, really strict. Basically, and other the, things. Basically, the Marine Corps for kids. Yes, but yep. with more Jesus. And uh, well, it's like Jesus has a punishment, though. Yeah, it's like, oh, you did this wrong thing. Jesus he is angry at you. you. You're here because you did wrong sin. You terrible child. Like, I'm sure wrong that there was sin. There's right sin. Yeah, I'm sure. That, <laughs> <laughs> sin. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Bad timing, Sam. Bad timing. So yeah, it, needless to say, it was bad, and it definitely put him down the path to his life of crime. Yeah, uh, it, it it didn't help him in any way. No, I mean, it if didn't. you it, got if you got beat by nuns for eighteen months, you wouldn't turn out to be a nice person. I think he'd come out with some weird fetishes. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. I guess it kind of just time jumps. There's not a whole lot that goes on with him after this. It seems like he may have. Probably been a he was roll he, so okay person yeah he was like rolling with local gangs with kids his, around his age and whatnot and he was committing like small crimes here and there like robbing the occasional like person and stuff like that he was actually doing things that weren't very common for that time which were like he was mugging people which is actually mm. how he came to to earn his name of Babyface Nelson. Yes, but that is a little bit later. Yes. The the point where he gets his nickname at least is a little bit later. So the yeah. Yeah, but he is involved with these little gangs. He's not getting caught and he's not into anything big time. Yeah. He's not and in a he big time never, racket. At this point he's not really like the lead guy in those No, not crimes. at all. Not so. at all. Um well, I guess the next significant thing that happens here is in 1928, he met and also married a woman by the name of Helen Wawrzak. <laughs> I, I saw that and was like, oh, I can't read that. That looks possibly Polish. Uh, W-A-W-R-Z-Y-N-I-A-K. You say it. <laughs> Wawrzak. Probably pretty close. Probably. Um, 
And to go, I did. You just know that that like her great great grandfather when he immigrated over here, he was like super drunk when he gave them their names. <laughs> they're like. Wawazik, yep, that's it. Sound that out. <laughs> Sa- <laughs> <laughs> they Polish. don't even know how to pronounce it. They're Polish, they're always drunk. Always. Oh, that's offensive, but I don't <laughs> know that he's Polish. It just looks like a Polish name, because they had a lot of uh, Ys and Zs to their name, and then they never pronounced Put in use to the least useful. That's right. They just want to make everyone feel included. Zebra, zoo, and that's all the Zs I know. <laughs> <laughs> Xylophone, dang it! <laughs> <laughs> Together they had two children, and... It seems like although he had some outgoing, might be borderline psychopathic tendencies, it definitely seems like he loved his wife, um, at least to some degree. Yeah. like <laughs> He didn't beat her. Yeah. Or at least she never reported it, and she always stayed okay. faithful to him to the day that he died. Which is that'd be really pretty surprising mm-hmm. yeah. for even that time period. And we'll the get time to period? it. We will get to it, but... There's a point in this story where you would just be like, okay, even the most loyal wife, maybe I would leave at this point. Um, and it's right at the end of Babyface's career, and it's yeah, it's heartwarming. So, I like, guess. what do you, what do you, what do you, Ish. yeah, he's yeah. in a gang, he's in a gang. Yep. When you're getting married, how how old was he when he got married? Uh, 1928. So he'd be 20 years old. So he's 20. Talking to this probably. We're gonna assume she, 18. No, okay, so no, she. Wait, yeah, no, she lied about it. They got they got married before that. I thought where he I'm trying was, to set up a funny joke. No, no, no. He was he was sorry. He <laughs> was 20. You're right. She was not 18 yet, so she lied. But and they wrote a different. They they said that she was 18, which okay. was accurate to like what most people did back then anyway. So it's a crime that most. Marriages. So yeah, I mean, you in. you lied on your military papers. You lied on. I'm twelve. You, I know. I'm eighteen. You look like you're twelve. I'm eighteen. There, I'm I mean, eighteen. There <laughs> was, I want to go die in the war. It's there fine. was a lot of that. There oh, was, I know. There was I, a ton I of know. that. It was crazy, especially in World War One, because back then there was less documentation as to who you even were. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. and then there's that's. Do we have dog? Pa- I don't care about that. They created dog tags for World War One. Yeah, that was like it's the, like. The well, uh, a bunch of people are going to go die. <laughs> Who was World this War One, bring in the greatest of inventions. Hey, here's an identification card that won't like crumple in water or burn or anything, so yeah. we know who you are when you die. Because when you get blown up by a you huge know, artillery when shell, you die. and yep. you know the interesting thing with this is, a lot of these gangsters, not all of them, but a lot of them, missed the war. Um, now some of them were in the war, and usually those guys are what kind of end up as the higher ranking ones it seems like yeah but if they're if they're in that little slot where they're just too young for the war there's not many men that come back from the war there's a lot of Mm -hmm. them that died over there and so there's a bigger area for them to take over i guess there's there's more room for them to take over as a little guy than if there was a lot more guys in the gang Mm -hmm. but there's fewer men so therefore fewer men in the gang kind of not you know that just is an observation. I, I can't back that up with anything. Well, it makes sense. Besides though. just logic, I yeah. guess. Um, and so around this time, he was working at a standard oil station. And to not to basically pay the bills and make some money on the side, he took up stripping. Now. What? Now, well, Wait, hold what? up. Stripping as it was known then, is what you would call now leaving a car up on blocks. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, same I mean, he's got the, so that's how Babyface got his name. He became a stripper. <laughs> that was his stripper name. That's stripper right. name. Uh, no, so what, it, what stripping was was basically that. He would go and um, go to the local cars, or cars that are parked outside at night, you know, and be like, no, I'm going to take the hubcaps, going to take the wheels, going to take the doors, strip the car. And that was just what he did to make some money. So, And uh, so he was in Chicago still because he was born in Chicago, stayed in Chicago. This also allowed him to get involved with a lot of the bootlegging going on in that area. Um, he worked under Capone for a while. And yeah, so he was involved in that. That wasn't his. What do you tell your wife? What do you, what do you tell your wife? Like, oh, I'm going to go out with the boys. Well, actually, so... A lot of people in that era 
really were against the prohibition and like yeah, yeah. so that's that's the thing about crime back then was a lot of crime was actually <laughs> in favor of the people or people found favor with it because it brought them a lot of like like it brought them alcohol they were able to deal in different kinds of goods it really opened up the market a lot more for them so yeah. that's why like crime back then wasn't necessarily associated with like or not associated but targeted towards like common people or law-abiding citizens it was primarily against like banks um the, and the big the, guy, the, the man. big guy, the, the man, G man, the man, the man. yeah, the sticking to the lot, man, yeah, exactly. So and yeah, so that's that was something I found really interesting. Oh, for sure. And when we talked about Dillinger last time, we kind of saw that he was painted as this Robin Hood character who's throwing money out of the banks as he's robbing it, and he's vaulting over the the countertop so smoothly, and then. Um, him and a lot of the other gangsters at the same time would take bank loans and they would rip them up and give them back to the people like, hey, look, you were owing the bank this much money for your house or whatever. Yeah. Now they don't even have records of it because I just ripped them all up. Yeah. Um, and so that painted these gangsters as the good guy or the guy for the people. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about Babyface Nelson is he never does anything any of this no he does not do any of this in fact what it, it eventually comes down to is like hey you looking at me robbing this bank i'm gonna shoot you yeah. gotcha. it, so like the reason why he left al capone's gang and like stopped working for them is because he had nowhere to go up in it it was easy to join those gangs and whatnot because al capone needed a lot of manpower to do those small jobs because al capone was never really involved directly with his crimes he just organized it right and baby <clears throat> sorry baby face didn't want to be a follower or a henchman he wanted to be a leader he wanted to be public enemy num number one which is something that he really despised of john dillinger who was the first public enemy number one mm -hmm. and at the time that i didn't know this at the time that dillinger was public en enemy number one Babyface Nelson was actually uh, public enemy number two. Yes. And then moved up to number one. Because, because he died. licked a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Now, what he then moves on to with uh, his little band of cahoots that he's kind of gathered together is armed robbery. Um, and this is taking place roughly around 1930. That it, The 30s is really when gangsters reach their peak yeah. especially 33 34 yeah that's where uh dillinger had his peak that's where uh babyface will have his peak their stories like cross and intersect yes and they, they they really do um so 1930 he's breaking and entering um one of the first ones that's recorded is he breaks into the uh mag magazine executive charles m Riker his house, that guy's house and ties them up with adhesive tape and cuts the phone lines, ransacks the house for approximately $205,000 worth of Holy jewelry. Holy crap. That is equivalent in 2017, rather in, in 2017 dollars. That is the equivalent of $3 million. Oh my gosh. And that's his first like big organized crime. Yeah. Yeah. Three million dollars. That had to right be terrifying. Bat. Yeah, and really awesome for Babyface. Yeah, like, no, oh, I got for $3 sure. Three million dollars, and um, I, I don't know. I wonder how it would work back then with jewelry being less tradable, more more recognizable, certainly than yeah, ca cash. But still, yeah. I mean, but I mean, like he, since he didn't pay for it, he could sell it at a cheap, like sell it for a cheaper right. rate, and, and still make yeah, one hundred percent profit of off of it. Loads of money, and to like. A, a shop owner that receives that to resell it as merchandise, they can resell it at full value. And so they're like, I mean, it would technically speaking be easy because these guys weren't exactly like despised by the public. Right, right. And so then, I mean, he keeps doing this. And shortly after, he does another job just like it. Nets approximately $50,000 worth of jewelry. Holy cow. That would roll out to be about somewhere in like a million the million range uh maybe a little bit less did you did you find like an like a number of how much money he actually or like the estimated value of goods that he so, stole um throughout his career no okay uh, i wasn't not, sure. not his like overall number but 
because of this, um, he, the Chicago newspaper labeled them the tape bandits. Really? Yeah. So I didn't know that. The tape bandits. Not the sticky bandits. Not the sticky bandits. I feel like the sticky bandits would have been more appropriate. Probably. I actually found out a fun fact about John Dillinger, which I know this was in a John Dillinger episode, but I did find more stuff out about John Dillinger. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What's that? I found out that the government actually paid significantly more money or spent significantly more money than what John Dillinger stole in his entire career. That's amazing. He actually. stole roughly, um, I think it was like five, three to five million dollars. Something like that. While, so it was about $300,000 in that time while the government spent over a million dollars trying to catch him. That's amazing. Yeah. I thought it was 400000 he stole. Was it for, that he stole? Okay, maybe. That would make the numbers tighter, which would make a little bit more sense. Along with all of these house invasions as the tape bandits, this is where he finally gets his nickname. I just can't respect him as the tape bandits. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, so, uh, hey so, are you the tape bandits? Yeah, I got my duct tape right here. <laughs> they just start laughing at him. <laughs> Stop laughing. Stop it. You're like, aren't you the bandits from Home Alone 2? You know, yeah, we leave your water on after we leave. Oh, we're the wet that bandits. That was the wet bandits. This is the sticky bandits. You know the fun... <laughs> Why'd you say that? So gay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're like, oh, no, we're the sticky bandits. Sticky bandits. I don't like that. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, no, just the well, the, you, That would make so much sense, though, because this guy has a huge chip on his shoulder. So if he was the tape bandits and they start laughing at him when he unrolls the tape... <laughs> He's probably just going to shoot them because at yeah. that point he's he, he he's such a little child sometimes. Oh, but dude, he's like five foot four. Yeah, I mean he's so he's literally a little child. Yeah, he's a little insecure. He's too. very small. This would be like if you're familiar with the classic comedy duo of Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Yes, this would be like the one half of that duo with a Tommy gun. Yeah, basically. Yeah, um, except not fat. Same time yeah, era, though. It's, that's like, true. Yeah, it, it's, it is actually very similar. I think they were a little bit more 40s. Uh, so yeah, they, like, but they started years. in their 30s. True, yeah, yeah. I think their first film was like 1933. So eventually, he gets in, I guess, what you would consider the big time, and he breaks into the mayor's house. And I don't think the mayor was home at the time. No. I think it was just the mayor's wife. It was just the mayor's wife. Ties her up, robs him, blah 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 and gets away and when the mayor is giving the description to the police, she describes him as having a baby face. And so what do you think they started running in the newspapers? Babyface Nelson. The Sticky Bandits. <laughs> no! <laughs> the Sticky Bandits. The Tape Bandits. Um, but yeah, and he hated that. He absolutely he hated, hated that. that. Um, and th- that... that uh, crime that robbery actually was one of like the first times where he actually m- was like the person the reason why he stood out so much and she gave a description on him the most or the best description is because he was actually the one like pointing the gun at her robbing mm-hmm. her yeah. not the rest of the gang it was actually him which was one of the first times he showed like uh, more violence i mean obviously so, he yeah. taped people up, are but... they not wearing masks no this is no dude you got to remember, this is before the FBI really wanted to make sure. So this is going on before the FBI was pushing out like wanted posters and no. like fingerprint prints yes, and stuff they like were. that. No, no, not no. They no. Hold up, they weren't. Not it's, as much. Not as much. What this about was, the like cowboys out west? That, not as much. And they the, still wore masks. No, dude, you got to think. No, they wore, so like, because bandanas. of the gangsters, because of the gangsters, the FBI created a better communication and like. The FBI at this point in time was really a, um, just like a database for local police departments to get to. And a lot of local de- police departments did not like the FBI necessarily because they didn't really do much. They were a bureau. They were, they were literally like a bunch of office workers. It was like that the were BMV. Like, okay, we've got these pictures of guys. If you want to know more about the, like it was a, it was a, t- it was a pain in the butt to get any, any kind of information. It was like Jack, going to the BM, BMV. And BMV. Yeah, and, exactly. And think about this too. Back then there's not, cameras i mean there are cameras but there's not like personal cameras there's not a whole lot of there's no security cameras yeah so yeah but you don't want to okay so you go rob somebody you don't want to see him on the street and go hey that guy robbed well, me and here's another right. thing here's but another thing town a lot of crime in that time 
wasn't the way how a lot of criminals do their crime now. A lot of criminals do their time now to like hide from police. These guys wanted the infamy because it brought more money, it brought more henchmen to do. It, it could make them into the next Al Capone. If they became infamous and they knew they could, could get like henchmen and stuff like that, they could build a crime empire. And so it made it better for them to be known. And then they're untouchable. Yes. Then they are absolutely... Yeah, just like Al Capone. The police arrest them, and then, oh no, you have 50 henchmen out to kill all of your police department. Yeah, you, you've essentially just, like, signed a death wish for your entire police department. So it's, like, one of those things where the more infamous they become... And that's one thing that Babyface Nelson was really pushing for, was to become very infamous. Prestigious. Yeah, well-respected. He wanted respect, and he knew it was something that Among was, had the criminal earned. community. Yeah. That's why he left Al Capone's gang, as I said earlier. Because Al, Al was just too big for him. Yeah, he had no, he had no literally. chance to... He was literally like starting as an intern and working up and then going to a different company and owning that company. So he well, really... He, he went from being an intern at Al Capone being an intern at Dillinger. More on that later. More on that later. That's right. And There's some interesting stuff on that. Definitely. And uh, so... No one in his gang called him Babyface. Uh, generally, he was referred to as Jimmy um, or just George. And he actually preferred... Because those are synonyms of each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, they're, syn- they're synonyms of uh, Lester, for sure. I think <laughs> I think that's his real name. Yeah, yeah. Lester Gillis is his real name. Lester Joseph Gillis. Mm-hmm. And so I guess Jimmy out of Joseph, maybe, but... Eh. No? No. Um, <laughs> Well, no, actually, it's, it says here that his nickname, Jimmy, was derived from his middle name, Joseph. So okay, wrong. fine, Sam. Be right. Why don't I, I know, right? He actually referred to himself, <laughs> though, as... Too wrong. He referred to himself as Big George Nelson. That, that clearly... <laughs> but he was five foot four. I know, right? <laughs> I think my boots are taller than he is, or That's was. It. That nickname didn't really stick. No, I, I imagine say, not. You can just imagine, he probably has this, this like, I guess, kind of squeak, <laughs> squeaky voice. He's just like, his little... you can call me... Big George Nelson. Big like, George Nelson. Look, as he's looking up at everybody he's talking yeah, to. Big George Nelson from the, you from the tape gang me, looking for, George or the tape Nelson. bandits. <laughs> what? <laughs> you can call me Big George Nelson. That was me looking up away from the microphone. <laughs> I work with the, the tape bandits as well. It's like, you have no I'm respect the, whatsoever. I'm with the tape bandits. Yeah, you heard of me. <laughs> now, that was all going on right around, you know, 1930 beginning of 1930 and uh april 21st 1930 nelson robs his first bank making off with approximately four thousand dollars really you should have stuck with the home invasions because yep you netted a nice cool three million dollars in 2017 money on your first try and for the first <laughs> bank you netted a cool four thousand dollars <laughs> uh, wait that's in 2017 money no but oh, okay but he, when, in, in like, the first one, he, he had like 270 some thousand, right? 205,000. Oh, wow. I don't yeah, know where first, that seven came from. <laughs> on the first robbery. I'm an accountant, guys. Yeah. Just kidding. Um, I'm one of Al Capone's co- accountants. So, really, getting Ooh, that Ooh, look, 4, a number. 000. You get a number. You get a number. I'm the Bernie Sanders in numbers. Ooh. Uh, a month later, Nelson and his gang netted $25,000 worth of jewelry from another home invasion. And then on October 3rd, Nelson robbed the. Itasca State Bank. Uh, no idea what that is. I think that's just the name of the bank, but it's not a, a, it's not All a right. state, you know. Um, but he robbed that for forty six hundred dollars, and and I, I tell her there identified him as one of the robbers for oh. that one. It was like a twelve year old kid with a Tommy gun. <gasps> He's like, hey, no, that's just the kids that play in our back. Normal. Oh, and that'd be funny. So he's robbing a bank, and then he goes and he has tearaway pants because he was a stripper, and he tears off his <laughs> pants, and he's wearing like shorts, and he has a little kid outfit on, and oh, he just nice. goes and plays. He's in dressed the up sand. like Babe Ruth with what? <laughs> <laughs> Babe Ruth, Babe Sorry. Ruth, Babe Ruth. Which I don't think he was really famous at that point. I don't know I, much about well, baseball. Okay, I I don't know. okay. Yes, now on to yeah. Baby Ruth. Uh, yeah. So. Baby Ruth is a terrible uh, caramel candy that uh, sticks to literally everything in your mouth. The Great Gambino. Um, what? <laughs> that's his nickname, the Great Gambino. Oh. Jeez, man. I was thinking of Charles Gambino. I was li- and You're I was killing so me, Smalls. You're killing me. Oh, my gosh. I don't know football. Uh, baseball. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was an honest Anyways, accident. Sam. Yeah. So this the bank robberies kind of overlap with the armed robberies because when he robs the mayor, he's already committed his first bank robbery. Yes. Um. And so a side note to that with that with the robbery of the mayor. He gets a cool eighteen thousand dollars from their home. Ooh, that's invasion. not too hot. I can put that in my pocket. Oh, it's yes. cold hard cash. Mm-hmm. And on top of his, her description of him, he was good looking, hardly more than a boy, had dark hair, and was wearing a gray top coat with a brown felt hat, turned down brim. Yep, that sounds like a nineteen thirties gangster. Yep, and well, she also. M- was sure to say that, or made sure to say that he seemed like the kind of person that wouldn't do that kind of a crime. Which sounds just like Dillinger. Yep. They're just the, they wouldn't, they're atypical. To the people that are being robbed, they are not the typical. Yeah, they person. just don't look like that kind of person. They look too reformed. That's what the school taught them. Okay, so then on November 23rd, 1930, Nelson and his crew are linked to a botched roadhouse robbery in Summit, Illinois. In the ensuing gunfight, three people were killed and three wounded. And then, like, this is like a spree. So, like, all of 1930 is just them it's crazy. robbing, 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 yeah. robbing, robbing, robbing. Uh, three nights later, after the shootout, uh, Nelson's gang robbed a tavern in what, what, some Nel- somewhere. They robbed a tavern. And <laughs> Nelson committed his first murder of note when he fatally shot the stockbroker, Edwin R. Thompson. Is there any reason why he shot him or just, just to do it? It doesn't say. Okay, but so he just did it to do it as far as we know. It kind of seems like he escalates when he's when he's doing this. You know, it's kind of like... Someone bumps him to him on the street. Oh, oh, you want to oh, fight? No, There's a fight? story about that. Yeah, oh, no, for real. This guy, this at some point, he like... This is... Um, he seriously has a really bad temper. I'm going to take this pause to talk to you guys about our sponsor. RNS Photography is based out of Archbold, Ohio, and they take weddings, portraits, and business photography. To contact them about booking, be sure to check them out on Instagram at the link below. If you want to be shot, be shot by them. Photos, that is. Fast forward a little bit to the winter-ish of 1931, like January 1931. Most of the tape bandits are rounded up, and Nelson is... Caught on a bank robbery charge in Chicago, and he is then confined for a year. And then, that's it. Well, th- he's confined oh. for a year, and then he actually escapes because he, during a um, a move, they were moving him from yeah. one place to another. He gets out. Did you hear how they moved him around? Or how they move people around? No. All right, I got something juicy. Let's get juicy with it. All right. So essentially back then they didn't really have the funds to do like police cruiser, like escorts and stuff like that. So what they did is they hired a taxi and they had Babyface Nelson and one police officer inside of the the back of the car with him, just pointing a gun at him, transporting him from the courthouse or from the prison to the courthouse back to the prison. And on his way back from the courthouse to the prison, we don't, it's speculated that his wife gave him a little like thir- was a thirty five or thirty two caliber pistol or something. I don't know guns very a, well. A small like a thirty eight or like a um, twenty like a twenty five pocket pistol. Yeah, like a twenty five. It's just slightly larger than a twenty five. Okay, I think it, it was literally like a thirty or something. Yeah, like, I don't know. Been. A lot of the smaller um, like concealed weapons have weird calibers just yeah. because of the size of the yeah. weapon that, that it is. It was just like a it 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 wasn't a twenty five. Because I do remember doing research on the guns that they carried at the time. Okay. It was like, I think it was a 30. And pulls that out. It's not important. Needless to say. <laughs> now that I just wasted everybody's like last five minutes. But anyway. it's a fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. Pulls it out and like, we're going to be stopping up here and like gets out and stuff like that and then leaves. And that was actually the last time that he was in police custody. Oh, yeah. So He's why wouldn't the cop just shoot him? Because the cop wanted to go home to his wife and kids. And you got to think at the time, like, the cop was probably like, I could die or I could let this guy that's just robbing banks and stuff go. And these cops didn't really have a lot of uh, skin in the game, as it were. Yeah. Not yet. A lot. uh, Early on, most of these gangsters aren't really offending the officers. Later on, usually they get like, all right, we're going to get this guy one way Mm -hmm. or the other. And which is when a lot of the gangsters start to get killed and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Which is kind of. Kind of a coinky dink. <laughs> wow. You start shooting people in, in, in the blue and then 
they start shooting back yeah. real fast. Although I, I feel like Dillinger getting shot was a little bit less fair to him than oh yeah than no Babyface. Babyface killed like, people. Yeah, I feel like Babyface honestly should have been public enemy number one. Yeah, like yeah. in Dillinger, Ben. I mean, I, I wouldn't even put him in like the top three. No, he was just a gang leader who was successful at crime. Yeah. Whereas he was we... one of those guys that literally had conversations with the bank tellers, like, and it would like give him like a couple hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah, while he's yeah. robbing the bank, like, here you go, go buy yourself something. Like, here, like that's why they got away with so much is because people were never really threatened during a bank robbery. That's where Dillinger really stands apart from Babyface Nelson, which again you'll find out more Ooh. to come. Ooh. Now the the fun fact about him though is that throughout his life he is the as far as I saw in my research, he's the person who has killed the most law enforcement members in the line of duty. Really? Yeah. Because he killed FBI agents and just general police officers. I mean, security. He, did kill, he did kill a lot of them. He and killed Steve. A lot of them. And Steve. He definitely killed a Steve. Probably. Probably. Most likely a Steven, but you know. So he escapes. Steven Rogers, I think. He goes west to get away from all the craziness going on in Chicago. He goes out to Reno, and eventually he ends up in a town called Sausalito, California. Sausalito. While he's out there, um, he's in the San Francisco Bay Area. He gets involved in a lot of the crime rings out there. Yeah. Does some stuff. Gets involved with bootleggers. It's I'm kind of yada yaing his story here a little bit because there isn't a lot to know for that time period. Yeah. But, it wasn't very well documented. Again. Right. Of course. But there is a crucial point in this where he meets a man named John Paul Chase. John Paul Chase is... A handsome devil. Uh, yes. And he also meets uh, a man by the name of Fatso Negri. What? <laughs> yep. <laughs> now... I didn't know that. That's cool. These two guys become his close associates. Associates. Yes, associates <laughs> while he's out there in the West. And will eventually come back with him when he comes back to the Chicago area. Right. So while he's out there, he meets another famous bank robber. This guy was more famous out in the Midwest by the name of Eddie Bentz. And this guy brings him back in on a job and they commit a major bank robbery on August 18th, 1933 in Grand Haven, Michigan. And it wasn't exactly one of their most uh, money raking in schemes of all time, but much like all these bank robberies, it was in that you know four thousand range, um, but it was a clean getaway. Yeah, no, a lot of it, it's interesting because a lot of the crimes that they do, like a lot of the bank robberies that they do, what? <laughs> bank it's robbies? actually very, it's <laughs> actually very interesting because a lot of the crime and like bank robberies that they do, they don't time their actual robberies correctly, and they will like rob the bank right before like another like shipment of money comes into the bank. Yeah. It'll be like they go, they rob the bank, they leave. Later that day, the bank gets more money. It's like a reoccurring thing. And it's something where it's like, yeah, that's where John Dillinger was a lot better at it. It was at this time that Nelson really was touring the country, uh, you might say, because he was going to Iowa. He was in South Dakota. He was in Mississippi. And robbing places and in the midst of this several people are killed uh from bystanders to police and guards things like that people Could you are imagine that you're going to the bank you're trying to move some money around or you got a check you're in there some guy who comes in shoots you you're like come on man i just came to like <laughs> just try to cash my paycheck, just try to cash my paycheck. <laughs> and then you die and you're up in heaven you're like really like didn't even get paid this guy didn't eat like and He's then just you, a bank robber. You know the bank teller took that paycheck and just like cashed it, cashed it and put the money in his pocket. Do, 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 and then, yep. So the way that Dillinger and other gangsters like him would take money and throw it out to the crowd, you know, it's been said of Nelson that there were instances where he would go into the bank. And like I said, he does up his ante. So initially bank robberies are pretty 
vanilla as they go. Goes in, robs the bank, leaves. And then he puts on a little bit of flair and he goes in and he starts shooting the ceilings, you know. Mm-hmm. Classic gangster move. Go, 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 go. All right, everybody, give me your money. And then, little, un, unbeknownst to him, there are roofers, and he made he murdered six guys. <laughs> no, oh, no. Uh, and they're all twelve year olds because there's no child labor laws yet. <laughs> uh, but there's several yeah, instances <laughs> where he just starts like spraying groups of bystanders, like with a, a Tommy gun, presumably. So it's like no Russian in MW two. Yeah. Now, not a lot of people are killed in that, but they're hurt and they're injured from that. Well, yeah. no, they. You would want to die if you're shot in the when, 1930s, 20s, nineteen. 30s. 1930s? 19, you don't want to be yeah. operated on. You don't want surgery to happen in 1930s. No, not really. They're like, all right, so we're going to hit you with this hammer to knock you out. Hopefully <laughs> you don't die from just that. No, because if you're awake hammer. during this, it's going to hurt real bad. It's not a hammer. Okay, it's we like... have Klaus here. He's going to punch you in the face and knock you yeah. out. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, so there's an instance also here. Just kind of, I would guess this would be... Uh, Rapid fire pinpointing certain fun facts about his career during this time. Fire questions. He ends up in Texas, and while there, he meets an underworld gunsmith named Hyman Lemon. That's a real name. Wow, that's not a nickname. Hyman <laughs> Lemon. I think it might be Hyman, Hyman Lemon. Lemon. Hello, I'm Hyman Lemon. And from him, he purchases. Wait, a... is that ju- is that just a mis- mispronunciation of Hyman, Hyman Loman? No. Okay. Do you want Hyman? It's Herman Lerman, actually. Herman Lerman. <laughs> it's Herman Lerman. <laughs> I am from the Sesame Street or something weird like that. I don't know. I'm a puppet. So what he gets, I keep saying so. From Herman Lerman, he purchases. <laughs> <laughs> from Herman Lerman. You like the chef from the. <laughs> Herman Lerman. Herman Lerman. Herman Lerman. Herman Lerman. Sorry. Okay. Mm. So, that's true. So, from Hyman Lyman, one of these weapons that he purchased was a forty-five Colt that had been modified to be fully automatic. So, I'm guessing like a, a, a filed down uh, bolt catch or something like that, where you could just hold the trigger down and shoot through all nine rounds that those me- that those pistols held. Not the most, not the most effective, but Kind of cool. No, that's a that's actually what a lot of gangsters in that time did was carry small arms that they could just simply carry in their pocket because a lot of the interactions between between like the G men at the time were super close quarters. Yeah, yeah. And so this is the time when like Bonnie and Clyde are really upgrading their arsenal. They're using bigger guns like a like sawed down sporterized BAR rifles and stuff like that. Like, and so they were really looking for like. Easy concealability, but easy protection all at the same time. It's like, yeah, so they're using a lot of forty fives at this point, specifically uh, automatics. There was another instance where he was associated with one of the mobsters out west who was on trial at the time for bootlegging, I believe. Or no, I'm sorry, for fraud. He was on trial for fraud. and <gasps> Gangsters committed fraud? I know, right? What? It was later revealed that while he was out there, at the same time as this trial was going on, that he and another member of his gang were actually the ones who, uh, quote unquote, took out some of the key witnesses against the uh, the mobs, the mob bosses. Really? So he, he was helping them out. He kind of just okay. like, yeah, oh no, he took them out. Where'd they go? Who knows? Who knows? They were gone. They were gone today. I saw a guy walking down the bridge. He had some cool looking huge shoes on. Oh, maybe they were made out of concrete. I don't know. It looked like gone. he went first show to me, but you know. I can't do any kind of accent. I was like, hey, are those some Gucci cinder blocks you're wearing? And he's like, yeah, sure is. And I pushed him in the water. And then he was gone. <laughs> I pushed him in the water. I and knew- he didn't fall in because the shoes were too heavy. <laughs> I couldn't lift him. So you know what? Because I'm so small. So I shot him. I, sh- I carved the hole in the bottom of the bridge and he fell through. It was crazy. <laughs> I got under the bridge, took my saw. <laughs> felt Just like an episode like- of Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Bugs Bunny. <laughs> what the- oh. So it's kind of cool. Ah, gosh dang it. I did it again. Also during this time, John Dillinger escapes from prison with a wooden pistol. That's where these two first cross paths. At the same time, another fun story with Nelson happens. So John Dillinger has escaped and he arrives in Twin Cities, in the Twin Cities. And 
Nelson and his friend John Paul Chase, who we talked about before, are driving uh, presumably to meet him when they are cut off by another car. This car was driven by a paint salesman by the name of Theodore Kidder. And little babyface Nelson loses his dang mind because he got cut off. So he whips up on this guy, gives chase to him, pushes him to the curb, you know, gets forces him over, and then licks his shoots toes. Him. Oh. What? Just straight up shoots the Not guy. Not gonna lie, there's so many people that I I deal with on my daily commute that I just kind of want to do the same. I know, right? But that's that's ex- we do not condone violence on this podcast. No, this nor is nor po- do we yes do any violence. No, he forces the guy over, robs and shoots him. Could have just robbed him. Could have just been like, hey, sticks a gun in his face, like, hey, you don't know who you're dealing with. No, shoots him. Yeah, this guy's like out for a power grab. All the time, at any at any chance. Well, when chance. you're so short, you have to be. Yeah, people can't be cut yeah, off. Yeah, because uh, God I mean, cut off your toes. Oh gosh, God cut me off at the knees, so I'm cutting your life short. How'd you do that with a knife? <laughs> I don't know. Two days after this, they're all partnered up. Dillinger's second gang, yes, as they would soon be called. They strike. The second, na- the Security National Bank at Sioux well, Falls, South Dakota. Yes, and this is the this is the gang that um actually got the name the 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 Dillinger Gang. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Which Babyface Nelson didn't like. He wanted it to be, be the Babyface Gang, but Dillinger was insistent on the name, and Babyface was just like, "Fine, whatever. You won't be with us long, anyways." As he's yeah. looking up at him, the two the yeah. two of those guys, you'd think Dillinger is the head, but really those two are butting heads. Yeah. And so this is where Babyface is, it's his gang, so it's his, his guys, and he's really organizing all the, the robberies that come from this gang, which is why this next robbery at Sioux Falls goes the way it does, because Babyface was really the one in charge. At that robbery, there was actually an officer who was wounded. He was arriving on scene as they're getting away, and they're, he's wounded by Nelson, who just sprays him with his submachine gun. Um, because it was a squirt gun. Just sprays yep, him. Just sprays him with water. And then he slips on the water, falls, and breaks falls, his, falls break, into a bunch of bullets that were just laying on the ground. Breaks his elbow. Worst day ever. Worst day ever. Interestingly enough, two days after or sorry, a week after the robbery in Sioux Falls, on March thirteenth, the gang robbed the first national bank in Mason City, Iowa. And there, Dillinger and Hamilton, uh Hamilton's another member of the gang, are both wounded in the robbery. But on the blood on the plus side, they made off with fifty two thousand dollars. So that's a pretty which is better than their, their one at Sioux Falls, which was literally the the robbery that I was talking about earlier, where they robbed it, but they only got a very small amount of money back from it. This and this was another to go not to not to do this, but to go back to Sioux Falls. This was one of the his like movie star moments where he like. People assume that he kind of mimicked and, and got his ways from like gangster ab- abductations in films where he made everybody get down on the ground, like lie down, which nobody was really going to fight him because they, as far up to this point, no one ever got hurt in the robberies. But Nelson got like super mad during it. And like, this is one where he was really known for like shooting at the ceiling. And at one point, he got up on a counter in the middle of the bank and shot at a police officer that was on a motorcycle driving by which is what caused like the alarm to go off and like more police officers to come this kind of goes into um so that all takes place march 13th right and then this leads into what's known as little bohemia ah little bohemia little bohemia the lodge bohemia the lodge raid yep if you remember what we talked about in our previous episode Mm mm-hmm that's right. Go back and listen to that. Get educated, and come back to this point. So this occurs on the afternoon, or in, in the afternoon? On the afternoon? It, this occurs on the afternoon of April 20th, where Nelson, Dillinger, Van Meter, Carol, Hamilton, and all of those lovely gang associates are associated with their women, too. Yeah, they, they have yeah their, at this time, wives. all these guys are like with their with their babes. With their wives yeah. and or girlfriends yeah. at this nice lodge retreat. And 
the uh, law officials, the FBI gets tipped off to their their being there, and they swoop in on the lodge. A lot of the guys escape out the back, but Nelson is actually outside at the time, so he kind of has to finagle a little bit. Mm-hmm. He takes people hostage. Yeah, no, I heard he deliberately did this because he wanted to kill some of the G-men. Really, I didn't. And not, he came I did into hear that. I I did a little bit more research on like what he did, like what what footsteps and stuff he took in that whole situation where Dillinger and the rest of the gang went like like for example to the right, and he was like, "Well, they're all going that way, so they're gonna get like a whole bunch of people." I gotcha, just want to take gotcha. out some some G men and go a different way because everybody's gonna follow the gang. People won't really notice a straggler. And so, I guess that I guess that does tie in with his his psychopathic tendencies yeah. cuz he does show not just a here's a policeman that got in my way he does show like shooting at the bystanders it's this yeah. unnecessary level of killing not yeah. just not just a oh, he no, enjoys a the policeman. kill yeah he does he gets a thrill yeah that's actually said that he 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 went out of his way to encounter more police officers. No kill, no to, thrill. Yeah, exactly. No yeah. kill, no thrill. He's a, he is a class thrill seeker. He's yeah. not he's not the Robin Hood guy like we talked about. He wants thrills and kills. Yep. So he went the other way, and that's where he came in contact. He actually took the owner of the lodge yes, hostage. That's right. That's right. And he he <laughs> so when he stopped the car or whatever to to pick him up as a hostage another um two police off or two FBI agents drive by and he recognizes them as agents as G-men and he starts shooting at them and stuff like that and they they have that and that's where he kills two poli- two F- two of the FBI agents and that which is really sad because they are literally like 20 year olds that this is their first like mission at night none of them have any kind of training whatsoever this is where like the FBI almost lost all of their budget because they did not handle the situation well at all. I mean, civilians died and they lost innocent FBI agents and whatnot. So it's just like everybody that died was good or not involved with crime right, that they knew. Of. Right. And I may, I may have heard it a little bit differently. I, I have a little bit of a differing story here just with that. Um, they had actually, he'd actually gone and taken another captive. Uh, basically they were, he wasn't satisfied with the driving of the first captives pulls over gets new captives yes and they're about to leave when a car pulls up yes and that's it, what it was i i had just forgotten that no that, that's fine that's fine so there's a, there's two fbi agents and there's actually a uh, like a constable like a sheriff guy yes he just comes up to him doesn't even really give them a chance to do anything and blasts them with his automatic 45 mm-hmm. pistol now one of them is killed instantly and i want to say that Two, like you said, the two die, and but one is killed absolutely instantly. Yeah, and Nelson later actually questions why the other one, like there was there was one that uh, quote unquote had him cold uh, mm-hmm. down the sights, and they didn't fire. Really, didn't fire on him. And it turns out that when they investigated it, they found that the safety catch was on on the oh, guy's gun. No. Yeah, so he's. Can you imagine that? Like, you see a guy charging at you with a pistol. You raise your gun. You're like, oh, I got him. Click, 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 click. Boom, and you're dead. Like, yeah. in that heat of a moment with adrenaline running through your veins, you're not going to, like, think to check, oh, is my safety No, off? you're just going to want that thing to be ready to go. Exactly. Oh, man. Exactly. So that's just, that's sad. That's really yeah, sad. Yeah, that is really sad. Um, So, yeah. This is where uh, a lot of the women are captured because they stay behind. Yep. And the guys go off and escape because really mm-hmm. they're not they're not exactly. I mean, they're corroborative or they're uh, harboring, I guess. Yeah, they're harboring criminals, but they're not the criminals themselves. Did, did Nelson's wife get sent to jail? I think she did, didn't she? Um, I think. Yes, she she did. Um, they were actually they were interrogated by the FBI, and then they were, um, they were convicted on harboring charges. Oh, okay, but were released on parole. So again, all right. So they just they yeah. at least saw that like, hey, these people aren't exactly the worst criminals. The worst criminals are the guys that shoot the FBI agents in the car. Yeah, like mm, Babyface Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, 
I, I don't know what happened next. From what I remember, it was just kind of like, it was Richard Chase. Richard Chase, what? Um, What's the, his one buddy, his one gangster buddy. I just remember his end story at this point. Okay, there is, well, there's a little bit between that and that. The conclusion, or I guess this is more the build up to the conclusion of this story. After Little Bohemia occurs, a lot of the gang members from Dillinger's gang as well as Nelson's gang are either captured or killed. Um, one is yeah. killed when w- one is with Dillinger and is killed the, when they run through a police barricade and he's shot in the back uh, by a ricochet, actually. Oh, man. Kills him and they end up burying him while they're in hiding. Um, others are captured and arrested and, you know, all kinds of craziness goes on. Now, this leads up to July 22nd, 1934. That date should stand out to you if you listen to the Dillinger episode because this is the day that Dillinger is ambushed and killed outside of the Biograph Theater in Lincoln Park, Chicago. So, Dillinger's gone. The next day, the FBI announced that Pretty Boy Floyd was public enemy number one. Really? There, it didn't jump to babyface. Then, on October 22nd, 1934, Floyd was killed in a shootout with agents. So, who's left? Babyface Nelson becomes public enemy number one. And again, dun, dun, dun. he was super excited to get this title because this is what he had been fighting for since before he actually teamed up with Dillinger. Exactly. He teamed, he teamed up with Dillinger in order to get more notoriety to become public enemy number one because he wanted it so bad. Mm-hmm. Now, what did event with, with this notoriety? Manhunt. FBI agents everywhere and law enforcement everywhere is now looking for Babyface Nelson with much more of a drive, dri- desire, yeah, I guess uh, passion. They're they're much know. more when focused it, on him. They weren't they were focused on him before. Like it was like when if you they kill him, one of theirs, they get real mad. Yeah, yeah. but oddly enough, like and when you get labeled, Dillinger didn't really do that. I know it's the weird thing. So with that's Dillinger. why I don't feel like Dillinger should have been public enemy number one. I, yeah, but it makes I, sense yeah. that the government wanted him to be. Yeah, Public absolutely, he, absolutely. He kept stealing their money. <laughs> yeah, and the people loved him as kind of that like yeah Ugh, thing. Um, so to escape kind of the heat, Nelson's going out west, goes back to Reno and everything. Um, but then eventually he swings back into Chicago, and it's actually this is the um, really the last furious gun battle between FBI agents and Nelson. And this is intense. It really is. And because of his, you know, he's like Dillinger. Dillinger was a folklore character. Babyface Nelson is a folklore character. There's some mix and match stories. Some people will say one thing. Others will say another. I've seen differences in terms of uh, how many times he was shot. But I got a consistent number, but I don't know if it changes deal. yours. Good uh I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Um, but we'll try to give the most well documented and backed up story. Yeah. And we'll add some of the other ones just to give you a flair uh, or a taste of the flair that was added by, you know, uh, the game of telephone that happens when you t- start telling stories about yeah. the famous gangsters of your day. If you're a grandpa telling your grandkids about Babyface Nelson and you were maybe you saw something happen, you saw one of his robberies, you're going to spice it up a little bit. So that can happen with stories like this. Mm -hmm. Now, this all takes place just outside of Chicago in a town known as uh, Barrington. And at this place, the ensuing gun battle actually results in the deaths of Nelson and federal agents Herman Herman Hollis and Samuel Cowley. Yes. Very unfortunate. Two American heroes. Yes. Two more of these... uh, law enforcement officials who end up dead because of Nelson. Inter- interesting thing about uh, Cowley or whatever his name is, he was actually sent, he was the guy that was sent to work with the local police department to try and find Babyface Nelson and ca- really clean up the local police department and like um, and FBI departments and stuff like that. He, came, oh. he, he was sent in by name of Jedgar Hoover and he was really like he he really helped find like um, Dillinger and stuff like that, and so 
Yeah, he he was actually kind of like a big name in this, in, nice. in the whole like development of the FBI and who they are today and how they refined what they are today. I'm trying to pinpoint where this starts. What I found, and you can take this off record, James. Yeah, that's go, ahead, right. go ahead and talk. Okay. Talk now, yeah. So what I found was that they were driving down the highway uh, in Illinois, whatever, wherever they currently are. I forget what the, the place was. Yeah. They're driving down the highway, and uh, Cowley and the other guy were actually driving on the other in the other lane. Like, yeah, like there's like a little grass patch in between both sides of the road or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, – they recognize Babyface in the other car driving past, and so they turn around and they they get into a hot pursuit at seventy miles an hour, at this time, like crazy. That's fast. Very crazy. Um, and so then they get into a gunfight, and then Babyface is remembered saying from his wife and by whatever the other guy's name, Chase. What's his last oh, first uh, name? Uh, James Chase. John Chase. John Chase. Remembered by by his wife and by John Chase saying, "I've had enough of this." We're settling this now, and he did a U-turn, or he like quickly like turned his car around to face the oncoming car, got out of his car with his Tommy gun, and started shooting at them before they could even stop the car and get out of the car. And that's when he get in got into the the gunfight, and um, it was said that he he was taking cover, and he's like he was taking cover with John Chase, and he leaned over to John John Chase and said. I'm done with, the, like, I'm ending this now. And so got got hopped out from behind cover and started just filling these dudes up with lead, shooting at them, and they, in return, filled them with 17 bullet holes. That's the number I remember. He got shot 17 times, killed both of them. See, I've heard 17, and I've heard 9. Or, yeah, I think 9. I heard consistently that it was, even on the medical report, that it was 17. Who shot him 17 times, though? Um, It was Stephen Cowley and whoever the other guy was that was in the car. Because they would be both dead at that point. He gets away. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. They shoot him as he... Because he doesn't have time to pull the Tommy gun up to his head, like, up to his shoulder. He's firing from the hip, which is uncommon. But he's just spraying that place with bullets. And they shoot him a bunch. And then he st- stumbles back to the car, and then he dies three hours later in a hospital and then they sneak his wife and john chase sneak him out and they go to bury him in a in a graveyard and they either get interrupted or didn't have the chance to bury him and they left him alongside the road wrapped up in a cloth that's what the two documentaries and in a couple articles that i read um told me this all takes place on what was then U.S. Highway 12 and what is now U.S. Highway uh, or U.S. 14, I guess, not U.S. Highway, just U.S. 14. It upgraded by two levels. That's right. Because of the two officers killed on it. Yeah. That's a terrible joke. Um, <laughs> how this all goes down is we have Nelson and Chase and his wife all driving south in a stolen V8 Ford towards Chicago. And in the opposite direction, we have federal agents. And they catch sight of each other simultaneously heading in opposite directions. And immediately they, uh, they actually are like kind of doing circles, like spinning around, like trying trying to catch each other. Um, They're doing U-turns to get behind the other person. (laughs) That's great. Eventually Nelson's uh, powerful Ford V8 rips up on him and, uh, they exchange gunfire back and forth. And uh, what what actually happens in that is... Now, I should clarify. The agents in this first car are McDade and Ryan. Now, these two guys end up pulling off to the side of the road, get into a field, and they're going to wait for Nelson to pull up on them so they have the jump on him. But in the gunfight, the water pump was actually damaged on Nelson's Ford, which it just basically loses power after that. Slowly, they're losing power. And uh, two other agents who had been called in, uh, Hollis and Cowley, pursue Babyface Nelson at this point. Now, uh, 
this whole exchange takes place in about five to 10 minutes. 10 minutes is the very maximum that all of this is happening in. It's, it's very high pace uh, action there. Initially when there's that first car chase between uh, McDade, Ryan and uh, Babyface Nelson, they're going like 60, 70 miles an hour, which is crazy fast for that time. Yeah. Of year. This is 1934. They don't speed have... limits were like as fast as a horse can trot. Basically, basically that's true. Um, so it ends up that, uh, these cars pull off and Nelson ends up in front of a, uh, a ditch and Cowley and Hollis, uh, Cowley and Hollis are on the North side by a park or do I have that backwards? I don't remember. They, I didn't get specifics like that. No, I'm sorry. Nelson and, uh, Helen, they're on the North side by a by a park and uh Hollis and Cowley are on the south side of the street. I actually watched a um an interview with a man who was like 7 years old at the time. He was a kid and they were delivering magazines to the gas stations on that road and they ended up witnessing from a distance all of this occurring and so I was watching a story where he kind of walked it through on a map, like showing like, okay, they were stopped here and they were fighting across here. And I was seeing the gun flashes. Um, That's crazy. I know. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely crazy. And what's even crazier is that Nelson has his wife with him. So he immediately like gets her into the ditch to keep her safe. And then he and chase are returning fire with the agents in the ensuing exchange of flying lead. A single bullet from Kali's machine gun strikes Nelson in the uh, stomach region, slices through his liver and his pancreas, and exits his lower back. Oof. oof. Yeah. So uh, instantly, he's just like leaning against the Ford. Um, his Ford Fiesta. His no, Fiesta. his uh, V8 Ford does not say. Well, they put a sombrero on it, so oh, it was a Fiesta. It was a Fiesta. You're right. <laughs> My uh, <laughs> FBI records did not show that, but you know. Well, they they thought it was kind of racist. So after he's wounded, Chase hears him mumbling about his weapon being uh, continually jamming. So they swap they swap weapons. So Nelson takes his uh, 351 Winchester rifle, which had also been customized to fire fully automatic. I want to see these guns so bad. They sound, well, they sound gangster. Yeah, they sound awesome. They uh, sound OG, bro. OG. So this is where he pulls oh. a uh, a Rambo move, and he steps out from behind the cover of the vehicle, advances towards the agents, firing the Winchester from the hip, basically. Two of his bullets uh, end up hitting Cowley, one in the chest, one in the stomach, knock him down. Um, and I want to say that he dies. He does not die instantly. Sorry, he's the one that dies later in the hospital, but he did eventually succumb to the wounds the next day. He gets hit again from Hollis's shotgun. He sh- gets shot in the leg. That's got to hurt. Yeah. So he's not, knocked- <laughs> he gets knocked down by a shotgun blast to the leg. That doesn't knock him down all the way though. Like that doesn't take he gets him down. back up, gets back up. He's one tough little man. And, uh, Hollis maybe already injured. We don't really know at this point. He moves to, uh, get cover behind a, uh, telephone pole. And is then shot through the head. Oof. This is exactly why you can never trust little people. Not to be like, you know, but they're always like psychopaths. Clearly. And it's actually said that he walks over to um, the dead body and like looks down at it, you know, gangster style. It doesn't I don't think he shoots it. I don't think he does like execution style because, like I said, the one guy does survive until the next day. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I mean, he also <laughs> Nielsen also got like filled with lead. So yeah, I mean, yeah. well, this is where it gets kind of confusing because Silas, you had said you read, and I'd read this too in one place that he'd been hit a total of seventeen times. Yes, which I read in uh, two different places. Okay, I couldn't find it in anything like absolutely confirming, such as um, such as the FBI records or something, but. According to what I was reading here, the Cook County Coroner actually yeah, the what? Say that ten times fast. The Cook County Coroner. Cook County Coroner. That's all I'm gonna say. 
they said that he was hit a total of nine times, eight times with uh, lead pellets in the leg and once through the abdomen. All right. Um, I mean, that would make sense. Either way, those were the two. It could have just been That's more pellets. eight foreign objects passing through your body. Yes. That doesn't sound fun at all. I'd yes. be done after one almost hits me. I mean, and I wouldn't like eight pieces of spaghetti going through me. No. That, <laughs> that would really suck. Especially the spaghetti. Be like, shooting, I thought you were my friend. Shooting a spaghetti out of a blunderbust. It's, it is actually, you know, I just read down to a part that I hadn't read before so kudos to me for not reading ahead <laughs> yeah good job sam it's yeah. head of research right here that's right it suggests that uh um the reason why it was incorrectly reported as 17 was because of j edgar hoover actually stating seven to ten wounds oh so i'm guessing maybe they heard Whoa. that as 17 that would make perfect sense yeah and either way he gets Either way, that's a lot of bullets. And this is a mortal wound for him. He got died. Um, so he, he is. They get later. back to the car, the Ford, and uh, he tells his wife, "I'm done for." And can you do it? Could you do it like the way how he said it? I'm done for. Oh no. Okay, don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was Moose. Wait, who's Moose? I don't know. <laughs> I Who think they actually end up taking the agent's car because, you know, they're water pumps damaged. So they take the agent's car and. Uh, oh, I read that wrong then. I thought that I thought that the other agent's car was their water pump was damaged. No, no, it was it was Nelson's car that was damaged. Oh, the other agents catch well, up. Well, look at me not being able to read and all. Oh, yeah. I have a degree. I didn't have to read to get it, though. Actually, I did, but. Nevertheless, yeah, they take the agent's car and end up trying to get to a safe house. But um, as I said, the next day, Hollis was pronounced dead at a, at the uh, hospital, which he was dead basically at the scene. Cowley lived a little bit longer and just long enough to like get almost to surgery. He ends up dying, and then um, two Nelson- bullets to the belly. Nelson end up, ends up dying with uh, his wife by his side, which is... Kind of peaceful. Yeah. He, I heard he died peacefully, like he just like slowly faded out. I yeah. mean, there's nothing peaceful about nine bullet wounds, but... No, not at all. Now, uh, what is kind of... Again, that's that's the first part of this, like, touching little um, sadness, I guess. Um, his wife stayed by his side the whole time until he died. And then they end up dropping his body off at a Catholic cemetery. Okay, so that was true then. Yeah, wrapped in a blanket. I wasn't sure the validity behind that. Yeah, I because I had heard he had been left by the road. I heard he'd been left on like an actual like uh, above ground like tomb thing that they did back then. Yeah. The, so I wasn't really sure, and I couldn't find any yeah, actual stuff. It always gets confusing with these stories, but. The best re- the best result that I could hear was that he was left um, outside of a cemetery, and he was wrapped in a blanket because his wife said he was he always hated getting cold, or he always hated being cold. Well, he's dead now, so yeah, he's, he's as cold as he can get. Pretty cold. One of the interesting things about this is just to kind of show how the lore gets built up around characters like this. It's actually suggested in some stories that. When uh, he does that final walk from behind the Ford to shoot the agents, that he comes out with two Tommy guns at the hip, and he's just shooting the Tommy guns straight from the hip the whole time. Now that didn't happen. From all, if that had happened, they would have been shot a lot more times than they were. He probably wouldn't have been shot once. Like exactly, only the office, only at the FBI agents would have gotten killed. But that's just one of those examples of kind of a folklore element being wrapped around a famous person. In comparison to the things that he has done, it doesn't necessarily sound like something that he wouldn't do. <laughs> that Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it sounds that's, exactly like something he would do. That's very true. The guy was crazy. Crazy! So, so to wrap all of this up, um, Helen was later captured after this and was sentenced to serve one year in uh, women's federal, in the in the women's federal reformatory reformatory in Mila, Michigan, um, 
Now, Chase was actually apprehended a little while later and did serve some prison time, but eventually was paroled in, let's see here. He was actually paroled in 1966. Yeah. And so he he lived at, in California and he was employed as a custodian for several years before eventually dying of cancer in 1973. That's exactly what I heard. Beautiful. It's really quite fascinating. I mean, yeah, he actually had kind of like a peaceful peaceful death that way. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a uh, redemption. You never yeah. know. You don't know. You never know what the, the janitor at your at your office used to be, and he might yeah. have been a crime boss. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, that's the wrap up for Babyface Nelson. That is the end of his story, and uh, he had a, a short run and a hot run, just like a lot of the gangsters that time, and unfortunately ended with him being a dead one. Yep. Very dead. As dead as you can get, in fact. But a really fun, quick little uh, side note that I want to talk about, which I found rather ridiculous when he was sentenced to uh to prison there's a a funny little sentence that he gets this was i believe when he was arrested for the car uh car theft he gets sentenced to one year to life yeah it's not life and it's not one year and it's not 10 years it's one year to life yeah i thought that was weird too that happened with uh, Dillinger, I think, as well. And it, it was a weird thing with the prison system back at the time where you'd kind of be graded like you could um, similar to if you ever watched the movie uh, Shawshank Redemption. Nope. OK, well, the way that they kind of could let you out on good behavior if they deemed you worthy, it's like, oh, you could serve up to life. If you're bad and we don't like you, or you could serve a year if we like you. That's how I understood it. I don't know. The prison system back then was really kind of... uh, Corrupt, maybe? Mm, Corrupt and weird, you know. Just maybe. They might have been just as abusive as the criminals who are inside. I don't know. No. And some some of the local police departments at that time? Yeah. Oh, Oh, no. Nope. Police officers are much better now, and we respect you and thank you for all the work that you do, and we know that we live in a safer society because of you. Exactly. Except for but those, back then, they were dirty, for, rotten pigs. Well, except for some of you who are still, you know, bad, because there's always bad people in yeah, any exactly. profession. And you can't, you can't say... Okay, oh, so let's Just like this Sam's back. the bad no, guy wait, in this No, wait, I have podcast. a rant. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so... Nice rant. Thanks. It was nice, short, and sweet, like all rants should be. Yes. Anywho, is that is that it for ev- is, like is that it for Babyface Nelson, Sam? That is all that there is written for Babyface Nelson. Well, thank right, you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Be sure to check us out on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Google Play. Um, if you have questions, topics, or if you want to be on the podcast, email us at thispodcastislava at gmail dot com. Also, one more thing. If you guys want to know more about gangsters, if you want us to do a um, more series on it, please contact us. Let us know so that we can continue to give you guys more info on them. You'll hear from us again at some point. We're gonna be mysterious, like Batman. The same bat time, same bat channel, but maybe a different bat time. <laughs> so, so be sure to check out our sponsor, RNS Photography. Um, give them some love and uh thanks so much for joining us love you bye bye now